John couldn't understand. Why are you coming to me? What on earth is bringing you, my king, coming to me to be baptized? Why would you want to do that? He says, I have need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? You know, it, it didn't make sense to him. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus is it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. chapter 10 and verse 34 through to 43 it says then Peter opened his mouth and said in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality well that's quite refreshing to know isn't it there's no partiality with God so how does that make you feel that there's no partiality with God, that God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't see one person any better than another person. He doesn't grade sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So every one of us is, is seen in the same way. We are all people who either accept Jesus as our Saviour and become a part of his kingdom and believe in him and trust in him and get to know the Lord in that way and get to know the Father through Jesus. We, Jesus is the representation of the Father's heart. So as we get to know God through Christ, we become his children, we become adopted into his family and there's no partiality. You cannot say, well, I'm more spiritual than you are. We cannot say, well, I'm I'm less than you are in God's kingdom and <clears throat> because you're this or because you're that um, then you know I'm obviously not as worthy as you are I'm not able to gain God's blessing in the same way that you are <clears throat> and that's not true we will all we will all get crowns according to what we've done in this in this life but that's when we get to heaven but here on earth God shows no partiality whatsoever every one of us are equal in God's sight. We are either part of his kingdom or we're part of Satan's kingdom. It's as simple as that. There is no hierarchy on earth of who is greater than anyone else. He showed us that very clearly when he talked to his disciples because they were all vying to be at his right or his left hand. And he said, what's that got to do with you? <laughs> you know, it's not for us to to work out who's better or who's worse. No, we're not judges. There's only one judge. There's only one true judge, and that is the Lord Jesus. He will judge. He's coming back as the judge and as our king. And so we just need to make sure we're right with him. That's all it's about. But there's no partiality. That's what we're told. No partiality at all. <coughs> God shows no partiality. This is according to Peter, who spent all that time with Jesus. <clears throat> it says in verse 35, and this is what I was getting to earlier, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that's really quite important, isn't it? <coughs> <coughs> But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So when we look at some of the nations around the world, we see people who are quite evil intent and um, 
you know, are acting very evil in many ways. But at the same time, we also know something else. We think of what's happened, uh, for example, recently in Iran, where, you know, there are people that have been out and out just purely um, going against um, what God would want in the world and acting as terrorists and all sorts of things. And yet at the same time in all of these nations there are people who fear God and they have works of righteousness because of their belief in God. And therefore it says here in verse 35 is accepted by him. So we've got to be careful when we judge other nations because in other nations there are, there are corrupt regimes, there are evil regimes that, that take over the people and the people, the poor people are under oppression and the Christian church is under persecution practically everywhere around the world. There is even persecution in England, not the same kind of persecution that is in other places, but there's still persecution. We are still kept um, away from any kind of uh, acceptance or blessing in this country. We have become a minority in, in our own country, in a sense. In a Christian country, it's no longer a Christian country, and we are a minority now as Christians in this country. It's quite amazing, really. I'm talking about true Christians now, not people who just say, well, I'm Church of England, or I go to this church. Or I'm talking about people who really trust God and believe in God and want to serve God. Uh, as as a you know a, a, a priority in life rather than just getting on with their life and saying I belong to such and such a church which is not really Christianity it's just a nonsense really no more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger it just doesn't work so we have to think about these things but it says here that every every nation there will be people who do understand about God that, that do have a faith in God and these people are going to do works of righteousness. We, we think of Rahab for example who was a prostitute in the city of Jericho and yet because of her faith that this God that uh, she believed was going to be her salvation she was saved out of a city of people who were totally opposite to God. So, you know, it, we, we mustn't judge people. We've got to accept the fact that there'll be people in every nation that, you know, want to honour God and believe in God and have faith in God. And that's really important. Verse 36 says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching priests, uh, peace through Jesus Christ, that he is Lord of all. So, this is the word. Anyone who hears this word, it doesn't matter where they are in the world, that's why this TV kind of broadcasting and YouTube is so important to us because somewhere someone can actually pick up this broadcast and understand the things of God and give their life to God. And so therefore we know then that that person is going to be um, become one of God's children. You know? Verse 37 says, That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, which we heard in Isaiah, that he, is going to, he was going to, the Father was going to hold the hand of, God, of, of, of Jesus that he was going to be with him and lead him out of the darkness and same as he's going to lead us out of the darkness so we know that Jesus was raised from the dead through that resurrection power that the Father had given him he was brought out of the darkness and brought out of the prison and he brought prisoners out with him it says in scriptures so he preached in prison in hell and he brought people out of hell verse 39 and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. So it's very, very clearly talking about Jesus being killed um, 
by hanging on a tree. Some some people make a big thing about this being hung on a tree, but you know it's about being hung on a piece of wood, a cross. It's made of wood. It's it's it comes from a tree, and so it's not an issue for us really. We know that that's how the um, that's how the the Romans killed people in that way. They crucified them, and whether it was on planks of wood or a tree bark that was you know a tree stump, it, it, it's of no it's of no value to worry about. The fact is he was crucified. That is the important thing, and he was put to death um, in a cruel death. Um, and it says in verse 40, Him God raised up on the third day and sho showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So there's clear indication then that Jesus did come back to life, that he was definitely dead. He wasn't in a coma. He didn't just go into a trance. You know, he was nailed to a tree and he died. And they put a spear in his side to make sure, like they did, to see if he was really dead or whether he'd just fallen asleep, you know, having a kip up there on the cross, which is ridiculous, or he'd gone into some sort of coma and he hadn't really died. And that spear pierced him and out came water and the blood. And obviously we know because, you know, blood then separates out when someone dies. It's no longer being pumped around the body, so it separates out. And so coming out with a separate blood and water showed that he was actually dead. There was no coming back from that. That was it. No physical comeback. And so he was taken down and put in a tomb. And three days later he was raised from the dead by the Father. So this is important and that people actually saw him. The witnesses, it says, um, and it wasn't to everybody, but to witnesses chosen before by God. And we know that there was over 500 people that he showed himself to after he was risen from the dead. Something quite important, really. It says, verse 42, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. So he's going to be the judge of the living and the dead, not just the living, but also the dead. So he would judge everyone. To him all the prophets witnesses witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So first of all, he is going to be, every one of us, he's going to be our judge. Secondly, all the prophets, because he told us earlier that he, he told people ahead of time. He told his people, always told his people ahead of time any judgments that were going to come. And because Christ is the judge, he's telling us ahead of time that he's coming back. He's coming back to tell us and to judge us and to make sure that we understand that he is our king, that he is our judge. And all the prophets, it says here, witnessed that. They all said that. They all pointed forward to Christ coming. And through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So there's a very clear message about the remission of sins. Do you feel that your sins are still with you? Do you still feel that you are someone who um, still needs a saviour? Are you someone who feels that they're still deep in sins and don't seem to be able to come out of it? then, you know, this is a very clear message to say, whoever believes in him, that's you and I, that we will receive remission of sins. Our sins will be remitted. They will be paid in full. That's what it means. That when Jesus died on the cross in your place, he paid the price for you and I. And so our sins he remitted. He paid the price. He paid in full. It's like getting a receipt from, you know, from the grocers. You know, your, your grocery bill is remitted. It's been paid in full. 
And that's what Jesus did for us in much deeper scale in that he, he took our punishment upon himself. So he was able to write across our sins as far as the Father is concerned, Jesus has paid the price for those sins. They have been remitted. They have been cancelled out. But not just cancelled out willy-nilly. Someone had to pay the price for them. How can a just God let guilty sinners go free? He can't. Or he wouldn't be just. And that's what it meant by bringing justice to the Gentiles. Someone would have to pay for their sin. And Jesus himself paid for our sins. He remitted our sins. No one else. He did that for our sins. He's taken them away. He washed them in his blood. He's covered us in his blood. And so therefore we can only just say thank you. That's all we can do. We can just fall on the mercy of God and, and just be so glad and so gracious, so grateful for what God has done for us by taking our punishment upon himself. And that's what it means here. And these witnesses, these witnesses recognized and give, give testimony to the fact that he was completely killed. He was completely dead. And the Father rose him up again so that we know that he is our covenant because no one else could do that. Only God could do that. And so this is now our new covenant, the covenant of grace through Christ's love for us, through the Father's love for us in sending his Son. And through Christ's love for us, he paid the price that we should pay so that we could go free. That is our covenant of grace. That if we believe in him, that we're under him, that we're in him, that everything is now cancelled and so therefore we can enjoy God forever. We can enjoy being a part of God and a part of God's kingdom forever because of what Jesus did for us. That's amazing. Let's just turn to the, the gospel very quickly. Verse 13, chapter, chapter 3, verse 13. Matthew's gospel. Chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And we wonder, well, why did he do that? This is the God-man. This is Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man. And he comes to the Jordan to be baptized by John, John the Baptist. And John, John obviously John tried to prevent him. John couldn't understand, why are you coming to me? What on earth is bringing you my king coming to me to be baptized. Why would you want to do that? He says, I have need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? You know, it, it didn't make sense to him. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus is it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So in a sense, there was a, there was a sense that Jesus was baptized to show that there was nothing in him that was unclean. That was all it was, to fulfill righteousness. To show that when he went to the cross, there was nothing anyone could have said about him before because he was baptized. He was cleansed. Not that he had committed any sins, he hadn't. But nobody could point the finger and say, ah, well, you know, didn't you get married with Mary Magdalene? Weren't you out with drunkards, getting drunk? Weren't you eating with sinners? Weren't you in all the places where all the robbers were and all the thieves? But he got baptised not because he'd committed any sins with any of those situations. Nothing had happened that was untoward. But he got baptized to make sure that we all know that he was fully righteous. And it was the fact that it showed us how we should be. To show us that we needed to 
cleansed, be cleansed of our sins. It was to fulfill righteousness, to show us this is the way forward, that there needs to be a baptism to take place, that we need to be baptized to show that we have been cleansed spiritually by God as an outward sign of what's happened to us inwardly and that we are burying the old man in baptism and coming out the other side as a new creature. It's a symbolic spiritual act that we're doing when we get baptized and it's to fulfill righteousness, it's to show where we've come from, it's to nail our colours to the mast as they would say in naval terms. It's to, you know, make sure which side of the fence we're on. I know these are concepts that are not easy for everybody to understand, but you understand what I'm saying is you have to stand up and be counted for what you believe in. That's what we're really talking about. And so being baptized is saying, I stand for God. I no longer stand for me. My old self has died. It's buried in baptism. And this is the new man now, living for Christ. That's what it's supposed to be about. That makes sense. And so in baptism, it's very simple, that's what we're doing. We're burying the old man. Just like the Israelites coming out of Egypt, they went through the sea. And they came out the other side into Jordan, into the promised land. And the Egyptians all died. Egypt was washed away from God's people. And they became a new people of God in a new land that God had planted them. And so therefore they were able to reach the promised land. And that's a, sim a symbol of us really in baptism that we, we, we go in and we wash Egypt off of us. The old self and we are cleansed and we come out into the promised land of being with Christ and following Christ as a follower of Jesus Christ and it's making that stance making that decision to follow God because we believe in Jesus Christ and we become followers of Christ in baptism and that's what he was effectively showing us so he allowed him and he baptized him. Then Jesus, when he'd been baptized, came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So he knew that Jesus was going to continue to go to the cross as the righteousness of God and to be our to be our sacrifice to take us into the kingdom of God to become the person who stood in our place and he could only stand in our place because he was perfect because he had no sins no blemish otherwise he would have been killed for his own sins but he died because he was innocent he died because he was the, the lamb without blemish or spot. And so therefore he became our sacrifice. He became our substitute. He was the one who was killed in our place. He was the one who took our punishment upon himself so that we could go free. So it's understanding these things that really help us in our continuation of life and understand what God wants of us. Why would you get baptized? Why do you need to be baptized? Well, it's to fulfill righteousness. It's to say, I stand with Jesus Christ. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. If that's what I'm expected to show to others, that I've died to my old life, and I now live for Christ, then this is my symbolic act. This is my spiritual act of being spiritually cleansed. The water is just ordinary water. It's not going to have any major effect on us. It's not going to stick to us. It's not going to do anything. But it's a symbolic spiritual act. And in that there is great um, effect, shall we say. There is great effect for us. 
And so it's making a statement. It's, it's actually putting Christ on the throne of our life and saying, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. My, my faith, my spirituality is in him. If I have a religion, it's loving Jesus. That's my religion. If you want to call it a religion, that's up to you. But that's it. It's my faith. It's my following of Christ. It's not about traditions. It's not about even baptism. It's not about a tradition. It's about a statement. It's about something that I do for God. It doesn't save me. It doesn't get me into heaven. In fact, the thief on the cross Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in heaven. And he had no chance of getting down off the cross and being baptized before he went. So it doesn't get you into heaven. But while we're here, we're living for, for Christ. And therefore we want to make that statement and show and be a witness. This is about being a witness. So that when we get baptized, we're witnessing the fact that God has done a mighty work in our heart. That we have become a new creature. That the old man has been put away, that we have repented and we have buried the old man in baptism and therefore we look forward to a new life and we can't go back. Once we've been baptized, you can't just get baptized again whenever you feel like it. When you've made that statement in your mind and you've made that decision to follow Christ in your heart, then you get baptized and that's it. You don't need to be baptized again. Once you've decided to be baptized and make that statement that you're following Christ, and you're putting off the old man, and you're going forward to honour God, that's it. That's all you need to do. And to live for Christ, to become a follower of Christ. The work starts then, really, to begin to move forward and to follow Jesus. And there needs to be, there needs to be a witness of a new heart, a new creation. Something has changed in you that you no longer desire to live the old life, that you desire to live a new life in Christ, that you no longer want to be the old person that you used to be, but that you actually want to find God's grace and live a life of grace rather than the life that you lived before. Amen.